Before I get started today, if my content is something that you enjoy, please like, comment, share and subscribe. Hit the bell and you can get notifications every time I make a new video. I'm trying to get to 1000 subscribers by the end of the year. So if you could do one or more of those things, it would really help my channel to grow, feed my ego, appease the algorithm gods and help me to make more content just like this. Right, so I am planning on doing a series that is essentially a guide to the 8th Doctor on audio, and since this is a lesser known Doctor with only two on-screen appearances that only total in two hours, I thought it would be a good idea to do a spoiler-free video, first outlining the kind of Doctor he is, exploits, listing his companions and what he got up to in his long lifetime, and while researching the life and chronology of the screen of Earth's incarnation, my brain turned into a smooth paste that could be used as a substitute for engine grease. The 8th Doctor is complicated. Very, very complicated, as would be expected from a Doctor born in the wilderness years. That 16 year stint between the cancellation of the show and the beginning of New Who. So I'm going to just talk about the TV movie and the audios. Frankly, I haven't read the novels and this is what I'm familiar with and it's my channel, so uh, so yeah. The Eighth Doctor first appeared in the TV movie, which is another video in and of itself. To put it simply, the TV movie is one attempt of many to revitalize the show, this time by giving it to the Americans. Producer Philip Siegel had been trying to launch an American produced series of Doctor Who for some years at this point, with Fox being the only network to really give it the time of day. They were a little bit skeptical, so they would only really commit to the show pending the performance of a TV movie. But it just couldn't get the ratings. Thank Rassilon's bouncing bubble, but it didn't. The TV movie is endearing. I like the casting of Paul McGann as the eighth Doctor. It was a stroke of genius. The man is incapable of doing a poor performance and he elevates the material just by stage presence alone. The Doctor is portrayed as a fanciful, whimsical, and even romantic figure. Him and the TARDIS are the best parts of this movie. And the fact that we never get to see this TARDIS interior again makes me very sad. But the plot of this TV movie was hot garbage and seemed to be a pilot that didn't know what type of show it wanted to be. It also commits that cardinal sin of having the Doctor kiss a lady. A complete betrayal of the character, I think you'd agree, as the Doctor only has eyes for one person. Although I have to admit it could have been a lot worse. The original idea for the TV movie involved the Doctor and the Master being brothers, the Doctor being half human on his mother's side, and they're both in line for the throne of Gallifrey, and are in search for their father, who is named Ulysses. The Cybermen would be reimagined as space pirates, and the Daleks would have looked like this. The only remaining remnants of this Americanized wank is this scene. This is to say, in the United States, the TV movie flopped, and despite strong viewing figures in the UK and Australia, it was never picked up by the BBC. But the Eighth Doctor has been significantly fleshed out in the extended material. In the audios and in the novels, he's depicted as a happy, chatty Edwardian adventurer with a deep love for humanity, a childlike wonder and seemingly limitless enthusiasm for exploring the unknown. He's an optimist, a romantic to the core, trusting to a fault, always wanting to see the good in people, a trait that is constantly taken advantage of. This one lived a long life, and not all of it was plain sailing. He led a life of temporal complexity, nearly unraveling the web of time once or twice, getting himself involved in paradoxes and parallel universes. He fought insane despots, godlike beings, and at one point he traveled through time and space with a gorilla named Steve who liked bananas. The audios take place at some undetermined point in the future from the Doctor's perspective, after the TV movie. Which is great if you're a fan of the novels, you can shove as many stories into that gap as you like. And it's always good when accommodations like this are made for the fans. The Eighth Doctor's audio run started with the monthly plays, with companion Charlotte Pollard, who the Doctor rescued from the airship R101. Charlie is an Edwardian adventurous and a perfect example of why companions don't always need to be people from the modern day. She's wonderful and they go on a bunch of space and historical adventures together. After the Charlie arc is complete, she stays on into the Divergent arc, where they are exiled from the universe and end up in one where time isn't a thing. Everything is still in motion, planets orbit their parent stars, night and day cycles exist, but time is not traversable, not a concept anyone has thought to invent, and nobody knows what a clock is, leaving the Doctor in a constant state of discomfort. It's here they meet Carez. He's a chameleon man! He changes colour and he's got scales, has a dark past, and is the kind of companion that I wish the show would take more of a chance on. Yes, they'd suck in historical episodes, but we already know that this universe has stuff that can alter somebody's appearance or alter perceptions. The Divergent arc was a chance to go full Ellis in Wonderland and do some real niche experimental shit, but they kind of gave up halfway through. After the show came back, bringing with it new potential audiences that they really should be trying to appeal to. So they kind of ended things early, went back to the normal universe and the monthly plays, 
closed off some character arcs, sent Charlie on a few adventures with the Sixth Doctor, and brought on the new Eighth Doctor Adventures range. This range was aimed at bringing in new listeners from the new show. The stories are shorter and not as experimental, but they're still really, really good, and the first couple episodes are designed as the perfect jumping on point. If you aren't familiar with audios as a medium, and are a new Who fan, this is where you should start. I kind of wish I did. I tried listening to them all in order, only to come across with Zagreus when I wasn't ready and my brain melted out of my ears. It really shows in the companion, Lucy Miller, also known as Lucy Bleeding Miller, and my favourite Eighth Doctor companion, next to Charlie of course. She's sort of a cross between the best traits of Rose and Donna, which is impressive, seeing as Donna wasn't really a character yet. She's from mid-2000s Blackpool, takes no shit from the Doctor, and she has probably the best character introduction in the entirety of the show. What the hell? You better hold on to something. What's happening? System's going haywire. <sighs> something, some power, tore open a rift about 2.4 meters from where I'm standing. <laughs> Whatever or whoever it was sent something through. An intruder. You. Ah. Huh. Yeah, intruder, right. I'm the doctor, by the way. And this is my home. You're trespassing in my home. JXE already harped on about this in her five hour video, so I'm not gonna do it here. So I'm just gonna play this clip. Hello, my name is Come. Anyway, the Lucy arc is brilliant and ends with a gut punch. And the doctor holds a reality TV show like The Apprentice to find a new companion. No, I'm not joking. That's the kind of crazy shit they can do on audios. They also have an episode that's based off Top Gear, where one of the hosts of the show is a sentient talking weasel, and another one is a giant sentient cock. One other interesting thing about this range is that the Doctor finally goes back to check on his granddaughter, his granddaughter who he left stranded on fucked up future Earth. One day I'll come back. Yes, I will come back. It may take almost a millennia and seven lifetimes, but I'll get around to it. I'm leaving now. Goodbye. She's all grown up now and an important figure in the new government. She has her own kid, who definitely isn't being taken in by an anti-alien group of facet xenophobes. The Eighth Doctor adventures can go to some really dark places, and some episodes can really tug at your heartstrings. I listen to this one a lot, it always makes me cry. But if you're a fan of the new show, this is a perfect place to dive in. Next in the Doctor's story, Big Finish has begun its descent into box set mania with dark eyes. It's here that a lot of people would find themselves priced out, unless you've recently come into a massive inheritance. The Eighth Doctor gets a bit of a revamp. Gone are the crushed velvet and jacket, and in its place, a leather jacket, jeans, and a shoulder bag to house a sonic screwdriver that clearly is compensating for something. In truth, I really, really love this thing. It seems to be based off the TARDIS interior itself with a HG Wells aesthetic. At time of recording, there is no official replica of this Sonic, leading many fans to make their own. This is mine. I made it out of hot glue, sprinkler fittings, and the internals of an 11th Doctor Sonic screwdriver that had nothing wrong with it. If you like, I could do a tutorial on how I made this thing. It was a lot of fun. Leave something in the comments. Dark Eyes is a quadrilogy of box sets, all focusing around this woman named Molly O'Sullivan. She's a fad, serving in World War I, and she has really dark eyes. And the Time Lords send the Doctor on a mission to uncover the plot to destroy the universe, which involves her dark eyes. There's some really good stories in this. The Doctor gets gassed, and we meet an audio-only incarnation of the Master, who very nicely bridges the gap between the TV movie and the War Master. He's played by Alex McQueen. This incarnation of the Master is bold, suave, charming, manipulating, and perfectly deranged. He's the kind of master who would charm your pants off and then slit your throat. The Doctor also picks up Liv Chanka, a seventh Doctor companion, who's a med tech from the planet Robots of Death. There's also this business with a thing called the Eminence, an entity that wants to make the universe into a hive mind, Skagra style. And you can make a drinking game out of the amount of times someone says retrogenitor particles. Liv Chanka continues into the Doom Coalition. The next quadrilogy of box sets that sees a ramping up of tensions in the lead up to the Time War, with the Eighth Doctor going on yet more missions for the Time Lords involving a new Time Lord villain called the Eleven. He's a villain that I'd love to see make the jump to the new show. He's a Time Lord with a regeneration based melody. You see, usually when a Time Lord regenerates, their personality changes. With the Eleven, that happens, but his previous personalities stick around as individual entities trapped inside his head, driving him insane. He has 10 of them now, all chatting away, arguing with each other, arguing with him, trying to assert control of his body. But the upshot of this is he can draw on their best attributes, making him a master manipulator, adept with guns, lockpicking, torture technique, any skills that he needs in that moment. He's able to convince anyone to do anything. He's very good at violence, and he wants to destroy the universe. 
In the first box set, the Doctor and Liv end up picking up a new companion, archaeologist and linguist Helen Sinclair. In the year 1963, better known as the only year ever, Helen is a bit of a tragic figure who suffered from an abusive upbringing from her father. She had to stand by and do nothing as her brother was disowned and sent away just for being gay, and is constantly overlooked in her profession because of her gender. Yet despite all of that, she's very optimistic, and the heart and soul of this TARDIS team. Through the course of the Doom Coalition, they thwart schemes to destroy the universe, stop Eleven with his various plots, meet River Song various times because she can't leave the Doctor's past selves alone, and at one point, the Doctor gets a haircut. The same TARDIS team continues into Ravenous, a series of box sets with less serialized stories, which also aren't available to buy individually for some reason. Eleven is still around, but the main villain for this one is the Ravenous, an ancient evil that feeds off Time Lords, and someone is setting it loose. There's some really good stories in this one. Each box set seems to have its own theme, with one of them featuring various incarnations of the Master, with a very good episode involving Missy and Helen going on a road trip through a depopulated future Earth. The series includes bumbling gods, monsters, and a very good Christmas special, where thousands of people are dragged into the fiery pit of Hell, and Helen learns how to fly the TARDIS. After that, we go into Stranded. A series where the TARDIS is dead and the Doctor, Liv and Helen end up stranded on Earth in 2020, where the Doctor finds himself a landlord with a bunch of tenants who live in a house that he bought over a hundred years ago that someone has made into flats. So the Doctor, Liv and Helen have to adjust to normal life in 21st century London. The Doctor has to fix plumbing, deal with complaints, and come to grips with the fact that his adventures may very well be over, that once again he is trapped in one time, one place, and may never travel space and time again. I mean, this obviously isn't going to be the end, we know this, the Doctor continues travelling. We are up to the 14th Doctor now, their TARDIS is still very much working, I hope. So at this point we know that it's not all going to end in a somehow COVID-free 2020. That and while this is going on, the 8th Doctor appears in various box sets, where he is forced to participate in various campaigns in the early days of the Time War. If I had to use one word to describe this incarnation's life, it'd be tragedy. He was a doctor born at the wrong time, completely unprepared and unequipped to handle the dark turn the universe was about to take. Some people in Gallifrey saw the Matrix predictions. They knew that the writing was on the wall, that the war was coming. It drove some people mad. And over the years, through all of his experience, all that he's lost, this adventurer with his head in the clouds darkened. He experienced horrible losses and pain, and he was forced into helping the Time Lords and found himself a pawn in their schemes. Many times the Doctor was forced to take part in the early years, but he stubbornly refused to fight. He kept to the fringes, helping out where he could. If you've seen anything with the Eighth Doctor in it, most likely it's going to be the mini-episode Night of the Doctor, released as part of the 50th anniversary celebrations in 2013. We see him here at the end of his run, weary and battered, in velvets that he seems to have been wearing for decades. This is the Doctor at his lowest point, desperately holding on to a past that no longer exists. To his persona of the pacifist adventurer, even as the universe became more hostile around him, even as the time war rages through the cosmos, unmaking countless worlds, creating more suffering than anyone could possibly imagine with a million lifetimes, he continues living out this fantasy, doing little to hide what he's actually doing. What the Doctor always does when responsibility is thrust upon him, he runs away, running away while the universe burns. And in the end, he gives in, does what needs to be done throws away his morals, his entire identity, and becomes what the universe needs him to be, a warrior. I'm sorry. I couldn't save you. I tried. He tried. I couldn't save him either. Did he really think he could stay apart from the war? Play the dashing, romantic hero forever. How full of hope he was. How naive. How foolish. So yeah, that is the Eighth Doctor era. The Eighth Doctor is not my favourite, but he is by far the most interesting incarnation. Paul McGann has been playing the part for a couple decades at this point, and over that time, he has been everything that is possible for the Doctor to be. They've released hundreds of plays at this point, and they show no signs of stopping anytime soon. So I hope this spoiler-free breakdown of the Eighth Doctor range has got some people interested in checking out this lost incarnation that most people know nothing about. Next in this series of videos, I'll be doing reviews of each era. I'm planning on taking five at a time and uh, seeing how we go from there. So join me in the next one when we start the Charlie Arc.